Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you can join us. Welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and Matt is out touring our nation's capital, so he won't be with us today. So I brought in Joel Bartko from Arizona Import Specialist to give me a hand helping you with your car. We are helping the motoring public have a better overall car experience. The best way for you to get involved with the show is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, we are taking calls as always, and as Jill mentioned, driver's education, and we thought we'd bring in the best in the business. We brought in Danny Bullock from the Bondurant School of High Performance Driving, and I don't know if you know this, but this is right down the street something that you can go get a lesson from, and it's not like driver's ed you took in high school. It's way better than that. So welcome, Danny. Thanks for coming in. Thank Tell you, us Danny. a little bit about what you do at Bondurant. What we do at the Bondurant School of High Performance Driving is is really try to take people who uh, have a different, a vast array of, of, of interests, whether they want to just be a better driver on the street and just learn a little bit more about the car they're driving, or if they have an interest in going racing, they might come and take uh, something like our Grand Prix road racing course, where we'll actually put them on the racetrack for a few days and really give them an in-depth uh, experience seeing what it's like to be on the racetrack. Well, I've known, I've known Joel for a, a number of years, and what he does is he calls me and he goes, oh, Dave, my daughter got in a car accident again, and uh, he's all frustrated, and he's paid so many deductibles, he can't remember how many that is. I went ahead and did a little Googling this morning, and one of the things I like about the Bondurant School of Driving is your teen courses. I was looking at it, and uh, Joel's quiet over there as if that doesn't really happen, but it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's seven fatalities of teenagers every day in this country, and as well as 800 a day that go into the hospital and are checked out. Is everything okay? Well, I don't want to make this a downer show. I do want to say there's tools out there. You've got a driver that you're putting in a car, and they're not going to listen to dad. You know, they're, dad doesn't, dad's not cool, but the Bonnerant School of Driving, and they brought us in a free certificate for one of their classes that they put on. At some point, uh, you're going to be, want to be watching our website uh, because we're going to give that away at some point. But tell us about your teenage driving school. The teenage driving course is designed to really give people a, or give the kids a, a a more in-depth training program. You know, when you go to a driver's ed at school or, you know, you go to your generic driving school where they put you on the street, you learn the basics of, oh, check your mirror, turn, use your turn signal. We go way deeper than that. We talk a lot about, you know, visual skills. And we also talk a lot about the vehicle's dynamics and weight transfer, things that most drivers on the street in general don't think about, uh, let alone the kids that are just new to driving. And so we give them a really cool experience and just learning a lot more about how the car works. Well, I thought it was pretty cool. We were talking about weight transfer, and I said, give me an example of that. And you said, hey, you know, something happens in front of you. Uh, you know, do you hit the brakes and run right in the back of them? What do you do? And there's, there's a weight transfer thing that you were talking about there. What, what's your reaction when a you know, car slams on the brakes ahead of you? Yeah, we have an exercise at, at the school that is, is probably the most, one of the most vital things that we have, especially for the, for the kids that are just driving. We have a, an, an accident avoidance exercise where we teach them how to avoid things that happen in front of them by doing more than just slamming on the brakes and hoping they stop in time. We, we give them a, a, you know, a method that helps them change lanes very effectively. And when we talk about the weight transfer in the car, yeah, we tell them lift off the gas. That's going to put a lot of weight on the front of the car. Uh, with that, you're going to be able to turn very well. The car's going to have a lot of grip on the front tires. And then you know, teaching after you make that lane change to get, the, get back on the gas slightly just to plant the back end so you keep it stable. And you'll find that the car turns and changes lanes way more effectively than it can stop. Well, I find that, you know, a a teenager has no experience in in us, too, as, you know, people have been driving for years. We haven't been in that situation before. So uh, I was reading up on your site last night, your skid cars. We don't know what cars are going to do when they go into a skid, although I do because I was always abusing my dad's car in some dirt parking lot. (laughs) But um, skid cars and what the car is going to do and how it's going to handle. We talked a little bit about driving in the rain. You said there's two types of drivers in the rain in this town. Explain that to me. Uh, you know, my personal experience, I see, uh, you know, we get people from all over the country here uh, in Arizona and, you know, some people are used to the rain, some people aren't, and some people have, you know, never driven in it. And you, I just find that when it starts to rain, you get some people that slow it way down because they think, oh, it's raining. It's going to be very slick. I better slow it down. Then you have another group of people that keep going 10 or 15 miles over the speed limit and think it's not a big deal driving in the wet. As if nothing's changed. 
The other thing, and this is my pet peeve, this is my soapbox, and uh, I think, Joel, you're an offender, so maybe you and I should talk after the show, <laughs> but the zipper effect when you're merging. You know, uh, we talked about turning on the blinker, you know, when you're getting on the highway, and the blinker is, for me, I'm not asking permission, as you said, I'm telling you I'm coming over. But as soon as you turn the blinker on, you got two characters. One guy will kind of flicker the lights and let you know you're clear to come in. The next guy, man, he closes that gap and there's no getting over. And because I'm a little bit of a, you know, a little passive aggressive, I just go ahead and lean over anyway. I just move anyway. If he's closing the gap, I'm coming over, Joel. Like you said, Dave, I'm very interested in the teenage driving thing. I was excited to learn that you can take a driver that's been driving for like six months already, take them there for some of the more advanced classes to learn Accident avoidance, which in my particular case, would have been really good to learn with my kids and everything <laughs> like that. But I think it would be good for anybody. I myself interested in going to more of the high-speed kind of classes that they have there for racing. Not that I want to be a race car driver, but the thrill of driving and skidding out always interested me. I've been out there one time, and I went, I went for a hot lop with uh, Bob Bondurant, and he just turned 80 this last year. That was insane. I couldn't. Bl- I kept looking over, like I hope this guy's really doing well because yeah. we're going really <laughs> fast in this car. And uh, I literally got out of, the, out of the car, and I think we went for five laps. And I was like motion sick. I mean, it was a, it was a good time. But I think the team thing is the thing I really wanted. You know, everyone to walk away from. These are people that you're driving with every day on the road. Teens need more than just dad taking you in the parking lot. You know. And, oh yeah. <clears throat> and you you learn to drive stick in the parking lot, not on the highway. You know, but here at, here at Bondurant, you know, you can learn on the highway, but it's it's set up in a safe environment, so you can really find out what the car does and what it doesn't do. And until you know that, you know, when that, that situation comes up, as it will, you're going to know what to do and how to react. And learning in a skid or something like that, or going around a turn where instead of just panicking and locking up the brakes, knowing maybe how to steer out of it, I was interested in learning about oversteer and understeer. I've always heard those terms, been a car guy my whole life, don't really know exactly what they mean. Well, we actually have a skid car where we teach people how to control a car that gets into an oversteer slide or an understeer slide. And most people hear those terms, they don't necessarily know what they mean. When you're in an understeer slide, it's uh, when you're turning the wheel expecting to go through a corner and the car continues to go straight. It has lost that grip on the front tires. And in an oversteer slide is when you turn the wheel and the the back end wants to come out from underneath the driver, uh, you know, like a, a spin out. And so we've got these 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 cars with the training wheels on the side. Where they're called skid cars, where you get to you know drive it and feel the car. The, the instructor can raise the back end up a little bit or the front end a little bit to uh, simulate those slides, and then you have to then rectify that or recover from that that slide. Probably the most important tool we've got there on the facility is that skid car. I I personally always I wholeheartedly believe that, and always tell people I think every high school should have one of those skid cars on its property. Well, I'm pretty convinced that you have a dream dream job oh yeah i mean how many guys get to wake (laughs) up in the morning and work on a race car oh yeah or or teach people how to drive like a race car driver he actually started out as a mechanic there at bondurant so he has something in common with uh with joel and i we came in we thought we're gonna ask him all kinds of questions he said no wait 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 i've got the timing belt off on my volkswagen (laughs) at home and i got a little bit of a question as far as the timing mark on the cam and the crank can you help me out in that direction so it is a dream job you guys have got go-karts out there what else do you have oh we've got uh we've got a fleet of, of shifter carts out there these things go from zero to 100 miles an hour in about six seconds and uh you know people come out and take those classes we have them five nights a week we've got some 400 horsepower chevy camaro ss's that we use for the high performance driving classes and we also have the 438 horsepower grand sport corvette and that car is used for the uh for the most popular course the grand prix road racing course that joel you'd probably be really interested in that course there and we also have some 505 horsepower z06 corvettes that we use for another two-day class called the z06 experience Mm. Oh, yeah. Very cool cars. And then we've also got the flagship, the 638 horsepower supercharged uh, ZR1 Corvettes that we use for a ZR1 class. Uh, the sign me up for that one. So I think it, it, it sounds like it's not that unaffordable. And when you consider that you've got a $500 deductible or a $1,000 deductible and you need to go find out how cars work and you need a teenager to learn from somebody other than you how the cars work. So when we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, who has been ditched by Matt Allen again. I know he's listening, so I'm having a good time teasing him. But uh, he's touring our nation's capital. So we've got Joel Bartko from Arizona Import Specialist to come give me a hand, helping you 
with your car. And we've got Danny from the Bonnerant School of High Performance Driving. And he's got me very excited about going down there. And I've been down there before, and it was fun. I mean, I was smiling for days after going there. But it, there's some practical knowledge that you can learn or you can send a teenager to learn, uh, whether you want to be a race car driver or not. It's not all about that. It's about knowing, you know, and Danny said, having a better working knowledge of the car. So if you've got any questions as far as driving cars, how you want to do it, uh, or any questions about the school in general and what they do, feel free to reach out to us at 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTAR. And if you've got a question about your car, we're always good for that. So up first this segment, we are going to go with, looks like Jennifer with a 2007 Honda Civic Hybrid. Go ahead, Jennifer. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Um, I have a quick, couple quick questions for you. Uh, we have an outside uh, Civic Hybrid. Brought it brand new back in April of 2007. Currently, it's got 172,000 miles on it. And I'm actually curious about what the lifespan of the car itself is and then what the lifespan of the IMA battery that controls all the electrical components is. I don't know, Joel. You got any, any history with that? Well, I've been doing with the hybrids for the last few years. They've been really excellent, much better than I thought when they first came out. It was kind of newfangled technology to us. I've gone to training and learned about them. Average life of those batteries has been around 100,000 miles or up to five years. I've seen them fail earlier. I have a customer that's gone over 200 with the same car. The rest of the car is a Honda Civic, which, if you maintain it, pretty indestructible car there. Hey, Jennifer, how have you liked the car overall? Oh, we it, it, it served its purpose very well. We've made a couple moves in the process from Oregon to Arizona, and uh, my husband on average drives about probably, we drive about 1,000 miles plus a month with the vehicle. Oh, because he lives, uh, we work, live in Sandhead Valley. He works in Chandler, and then he also goes to Arizona State. So well, the car really gets a lot of good mileage, and for the most part, gets very good gas mileage. Well, thanks so much for the call, Jennifer. Hybrids, more and more. You ever driven one, Danny? Are you guys going to put any on there down at the Bonneron School of Driving? I've driven some. I don't know that we'll have any there right away. Uh, really, what we do is we 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 stock the uh, school with what Chevrolet wants to have there. And right now, the big cars they want to push are the Corvettes and the Camaro SSs. But they're not pushing the uh, Corvette hybrid, are they? Not yet. No, I haven't <laughs> seen one yet. <laughs> I'd be curious to see one uh, come out, though. Volkswagen just came out with a turbo hybrid. A turbo hybrid? What, what's, do you know anything about it yet? You're just waiting to see. Just waiting to see it and see what's going to go on. Okay. It's supposed to be pretty fast. Well, thanks so much for the call, Jennifer. We are going to go with Ron in Mesa since it's hybrid day. Apparently it is. It's driving day also, by the way. On a 2005, looks like a Prius. Go ahead, uh, Ron. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, well, thank you for having me on, and uh, have a great weekend. Um, my main question uh, with the Prius is I just had some bad news yesterday, and I, you know, it might be good news, bad news, but the front struts and rear struts, I had taken it in for an alignment, and the mechanic had uh, talked about the struts being bad. Is there a, um, the interval, time intervals, you know, how many miles he, that those should be changed out at? How many miles do you have on your car, Ron? On them as well for labor and parts, you think? Yeah, Ron, how many miles do you have on your Prius? 134,000. 134K. Okay. Well, Joel looks like he's got an answer here for you. Hold on. Well, I'd be looking, are you feeling any drivability? Like, is the car bouncy all over the place? Are the tires wearing? Are they leaking? Why do you want to replace them? Well, the, I, had, I had to replace the rears in January, and I knew the fronts were going bad. They're wearing on the inside uh, uh, part of the tread. Well, and and I think there's some tracking on it. As I'm going down the freeway, I can kind of feel it. I won't say any bouncing per se, but it's more of a, you know, not really a pull, but it just seems like it goes with the groove of the highway. Well, that, I don't know if that's natural anyway, but... That really wouldn't be struts doing that. Your struts should be looked at, but usually pulling or anything like that would be more concerned with tie rods and steering rack and control arm bushings and things like that. As far as his question there, he asked, you know, d you know, is there, is there a service interval with struts? Not really. Technically, not. there isn't. You start looking at struts maybe at the 80,000, 90,000 mile mark. You start to consider exactly. them. Exactly. 80 to 100, I'd be looking at them. Now, he asked the other question about price. And I think on struts, price, you can, you can do a strut without doing a strut mount. Am I correct? Yeah, but if you're going to do new struts, you want to put new strut mounts in, new bump stops, everything, and do the job complete, not to skimp out and buy a high-quality strut. High-quality strut. Now, when he's saying catching grooves in the road, I think of tires. 
I agree with you there 100 percent tires and alignment so two struts two tires and alignment sounds like a good deal uh and, and it comes into safety now struts when you do have a bad strut and you want to know the knowledge of that car uh danny can't fall asleep on me we're not we're talking cars and safety here <laughs> <laughs> but when you have bad struts and you have one a weak strut man the handling of the car is not good if you go to if you go to corner onto a, a bad strut it's not going to feel right i mean that's the that's the thing where your stability on the road yeah and that and a lot of times you know you can pounce on the corner of a car and see if it hops up and down and it should only bounce one time, maybe? Yeah. But the, the old days, what they used to say, change them every 30,000 or 60,000 are really gone. It's more, I'd be looking at them at 80 or 100, but there's no set mileage interval, no. So if you're not having a problem, but if you are, it's something you may want to look into. So thanks for the call, Ron. We're going to go with TJ in Chandler. Looks like on a 2011 Honda, Pri- or Honda Accord. Go ahead, TJ. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. I recently bought this 2011 Honda Accord, and... The seat um, is one of those fancy seats that does 10 different things, um, and all of them are extremely uncomfortable and make my back hurt like I don't want to drive the car. Is there anything that can be done about that? Mm, Joel, you got any ideas? Sometimes those seats just have too many adjustments for the average person. I'm sure there's one there that's got to make you comfortable, but I wouldn't know what to say. I know they move up, down, down. The lumbar yeah. support in the back. Yep. I know in my car I get the seat comfortable, and then someone like my wife gets in it and moves it, and I'm miserable for the next week trying to get the right setting again. That's just how it is. Yeah. I have to have a talk to Roseanne about that. Any ideas, Danny? You know, one of the things that we always talk about is trying to find a com- comfortable position before you even start driving. And, you know, she just bought the car. My suggestion is just sit in and play with it for a little bit and just mess with some of the controls and see what they do. Uh, if you don't like the lumbar support, make sure it's in the, you know, the farthest position so it's not up against your back. And if it has side bolsters, if anything like that, and uh, you don't like that, kind of put them at their widest position. And if, if you can reach all your controls uh, easily, then you know you're seated far enough away or close enough to the steering wheel and just mess with everything just see where everything goes first the one thing i like about heated seats is they they warm your back that helps my back i don't have (laughs) heated seats the one thing that you can't do what used to years ago was put on one of those pads that had straps and stuff around it because the air usually the seats nowadays have airbags in them and you can't do that anymore yeah that's a big deal we did a show on airbags last week and uh you can't i mean you can't just throw seat covers on just any old seat cover over a seat with airbags there's a special thread that uh that it's called airbag thread that they put in these seats so that it's able to blow out when the time comes so hey one thing danny i think that people misunderstand and maybe it's been out long enough so maybe it's not even an issue anymore but abs braking Analog brake systems, uh, something that I think most people are, are a lot more familiar with these days than they were a few years ago. Uh, what the ABS does for the car is uh, allow the car to uh, maintain the ability to steer under heavy brake load. You know, the old cars that we drove when we were growing up didn't have ABS, and so you slam on the brakes too hard, and uh, you lock the wheels up, and the car just skids. It doesn't turn. It doesn't do what you want it to do, and the ABS prevents that from happening. So now you have the, uh, you know, we have a different acronym for it at the school. We, we know that ABS stands for uh, analog bracism. We say it stands for the ability to brake and steer. Oh, yeah, that's a good way to put it, Joel. I was just going to say with the braking, I was always taught you had to pump the brakes. Nowadays, you hold your foot on the brake, and everybody drives different in different climates. you, you got to learn how to drive and what kind of car and what braking system you do have. Well, before we started the show, Joel asked, uh, asked Danny, he said, how long do you guys keep those cars before you ship them back and sell them to somebody or what you do with them and how do you maintain them? And uh, who would want to buy a car that's been used at Bondurant? Uh, he said, no, they're, they're actually well-maintained. Those things are in the shop all the time as far as getting regular maintenance because they are, they are driven hard. So when we come back, if you've got questions, 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. Matt is out. So we've got Joel Bartko from Arizona Imports that came down to give us a hand. And we've got Danny from the Bondurant School of High Performance Driving. I love this song. It's a good song, right? <laughs> Makes me want to go buy one, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, I wanted to bring something up about one of the shops at bumper bumperradiocom and that's Kurt's Auto Repair. Uh, they were one of the finalists, uh, one of the ten finalists in the 
Better Business Bureau 2013 Ethics Award. So, I mean, that is a big deal. Way to go, Kurt and Kathy. They run a great business. If you guys aren't familiar with them, they're one of the shops at BumperToBumperRadio.com. In mind, they're they're a flagship shop, but all the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio are flagship shops. But uh, they run a great business. It's very family run, and they're going to do right by you. Uh, so anyway, Kurtz Auto Repair I seventeen and Bell, way to go! And uh, I didn't realize you guys bring in officers from the Highway Patrol to teach them how to chips, teach them how to drive cars. Yeah, yeah. the guys who when they come in through a. Uh They'll typically take the police academy over in California, and if they have an, uh, a problem passing the driving portion of the academy, what the what typically they do is they come and sign up a class uh, with us for a few days and and learn a little bit more about driving and, and driving at higher speeds and get a little bit more out of the car. It's not a racing class; it's a uh, it's just something to help them get a little bit more vehicle knowledge. Well, cool, and I think uh, I see those highway chases on. Uh, it's it, the the class is called. High speed chase, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, we've got uh, Vince, Greg, Wayne, and Mike. We're going to go with Vince in Scottsdale on a 1999 Dodge Caravan. Go ahead, Vince. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Okay, I have a problem that's been plaguing my vehicle for about 18 months. Uh, the first symptom was I'd have to drive 100 miles after filling the tank to have the fuel gauge start to register. The, uh, the fuel gauge died. Uh, it was replaced by the shop. And the good news is that it started registering, you know, as soon as I started, a few miles after I started driving. So I thought that's all good. Problem was that it got fuel starved when it got to about, you know, a little less than a half of a tank. But when I'd go to fuel up, even though it was fuel starved, it would only take uh, 10 gallons to fill up the 20 gallon tank. So. Uh, it appeared the fuel gauge was registering fine, although the vehicle was not getting gas. Uh, so that left me in a position where until uh, I got to the shop, I'd have to fill up the car when it got to half a tank of gas. So uh, two fuel pumps later, because my understanding is the sending unit's uh, part of the fuel pump, uh, similar problems still persist. I mean, there's been uh, uh, various... Uh, nuances with it, but still the same problems. Uh, now, most recently, what it does is the the low-level red light, which uh, looks like a little gas pump, and the alarm will go off at any time, at, sometimes at three-quarter tank, sometimes at, you know, a half a tank. Um, the shop, uh, you know, talked to the dealer. Dealer suggested an instrument cluster might be the problem. Uh, I swapped out the instrument cluster, nothing changed. So that's where we're at. I mean, the shop is uh, certainly willing to uh, warranty out fuel pumps, but uh, I don't see that as being the problem, and I'm looking for a bumper to bumper to help me. All right, yeah. Joe, what do you got? I'd be interested in the fuel sender. It sounds like you've changed it already. I'd be worried about the installation of it. Maybe it got hung up when it put in. When the fuel light comes on, you're saying the tank's not empty, I'm assuming. Well, and the other thing, you know, the thing that came to mind is, is there a loose baffle in that thing that's hanging that thing up and affecting that, you know, that float on that uh, sending unit? Danny, come on, you got to have something. Ah, I don't know much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling like there's something loose in that tank that's that's hanging that thing up. I mean, where his gauge isn't, I mean, that's... I would think that somebody should pull that sender out and manually run it. Um, a good shop with a scanner can diagnose how the fuel gauge is working when the fuel light comes on, how much gas does it actually take? If the fuel light's coming on and it's only taking six or seven gallons, you probably have an issue with the sender, I'd be assuming, at that point. Maybe it wasn't installed right. Maybe, like Dave said, a baffle is loose hitting it in the tank. Shouldn't be that hard to it's diagnose. It's not that complicated of a system. It really isn't. But we're replacing clusters and doing all these other things. I think there's more diagnostic work needs to be done. You know, some sort of uh, empirical data needs to be gathered versus, ah, you know, we can try the try the cluster. You know, I don't think, I never find that to be an effective way to go about it. So thanks so much for the call, Vince. If you want to follow up, that was a lot of information for us to digest here over the air. You can go to bumper to bumper radio.com. There's a contact link. Send me the information that you just sent me and I'm going to, I'm going to look at through the problem database, see if I can find anything that's relatively similar in symptoms. So thanks for the call. We're going to go with Greg in Mesa. It looks like he's got a teen driving training question. Go ahead, Greg. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, uh, I take my kids out 
when they were young into these industrial parks that are vacant on the weekends. I find it much safer than the parking lots. They're always busy. <laughs> and um, as they're driving along down the roads, especially ones that kind of have slow, curving S to them and stuff, I just reach over and shut the key off. Mm. And that gives them a sense of when they throw um, uh, an accessory drive belt or the engine dies. They'll know what the brakes and the steering is going to feel like. You know, they're only doing maybe 20, 25 when I do this. It's not a high-speed thing. And um, it, it really helped a lot because uh, two of our four kids had issues come up where they threw the drive belts and uh, the engine stalled. Well, that could be, I mean, it could be a good point as long as you didn't turn the key off far enough to where it locked the steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> you went right into a dumpster <laughs> in some industrial park. But, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I had that happen to me. One time I was driving a rental Prius in California, took the family to Disneyland. And we're in the far left lane and traffic there. I mean, it's it's flowing. It's moving. And it's tight. And all of a sudden this Prius, you know, and this thing had like 5,000 miles on it. Just nothing. Oh. Nothing there. You know, so, I mean, I just like, just drag the wheel all the way to the right, you know, and hopefully they get out of my way, you know, to get over because you don't want to be broken down in the left lane in California at 5 o'clock traffic. Yeah, you know, uh, when you when you take flight lessons and learn how to fly an airplane, um, they go through training of, of when there's a failure. And when you take uh, helicopter lessons, they you go through training if there's a failure. Um, you know, if you're in a, in a safe area or something, I'm not one to recommend shutting a key off on somebody necessarily. But, I mean, if you obviously you've done it and it's come out to be a, a positive thing, which is good because now they know what to expect. Um, you know, you lose a power steering belt and now you have no power steering. You lose a, a belt that's, uh, that, you know, you, know, you run your alternator and now you see lights flashing on the dash and you have no idea what's going on. You, you Obviously, you want to be... Uh, uh, you know, have enough knowledge to know, hey, there's a problem here. I need to pull off to the side of the road and 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 know that there's there's something going on there. So I don't want to continue driving the car or or diagnose it very quickly. And Joel's over here on. laughing. What are you laughing at, Joel? I just know one thing. I took my kids to those industrial parks to drive. My daughter knows what I'm talking about. There's no scarier feeling in the world than being in that right hand seat with no controls and your 15 year old <laughs> kid driving that car. Yeah, I wonder. How, I wonder how how you felt when you uh, when you did that. Like if they didn't respond right, and you're in the passenger seat. Right. Well, hey, Greg, you know, I, it's kind of a weird thing that I do, but at Tri-City Transmission, we are the, like, we get a lot of noise issues. People say, oh, I've got a Tri-City. They'll figure it out. And one of the things I like to do is I'll be going 65, 70 on the freeway, and I will turn the key off just so I can get rid of the engine noise to see where it's coming from. And, and I'll have the customer in the car with me, and I'll say, hey, just so you know, I'm going to turn your car off, but I do this. It's a test, you know, because it freaks them out. Yeah. You know, but you're always afraid to go back too far, you know, and lock up the steering wheel. So it turns on all the gauges, and the car doesn't like it. <laughs> But you can hear that differential noise that you've been looking to for so long. So thanks for the call, Greg. Let's go with Mike in Santan Valley on a 2006 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I bought a 2006 uh, uh, Jeep Commander. And basically what's happened is like every time during the morning that it had been, we start driving it, it just gets stuck in second gear. And we can't shift it out. We have to turn off the car like two or three times just to get it back to go normal and then the service engine light comes on so we kind of took it in got the codes checked it turned out to be some solenoid valve that was the solenoid c or third and fourth gear had that replaced twice just recently got it back today and it ended up doing it again where it just i started driving and it just got stuck in second gear would not shift out of it so we turned it off a couple of times and to restart it up. So, I mean, the code came up as that solenoid pack, replaced it twice, and it's still doing the same thing. How many miles is on that is on that uh, Jeep? Uh, I got 100,000 now on it. Okay. In, in what engine's in there? It's the V6. 3.7 liter? Yep. Okay. Well, I think um, this is one of the confusions that happens in the transmission business all the time. People go down and they get a they get a code and they'll go down to maybe Acme Auto Parts or whatever it is, and the code comes out as solenoid. And everybody's heard the good news at the transmission shop: if you can get a solenoid and not a transmission, you're happy. You know, so a solenoid is great news, and especially a solenoid pack. Now, 
one of the most common things that people confuse is there is solenoid codes, which are electrical faults or electrical mechanical fault to that solenoid, but there's also solenoid performance codes. So on a Ford, I think of it a Ford truck, it'll say, you know, shift solenoid stuck off. And so they go, oh, the solenoid stuck. We'll just go. But the very definition of the code, that's what confuses everybody. So it knows we turned the solenoid on. It knows we didn't get the response that we wanted. So it's a solenoid performance code, less a solenoid code. So, and then the other thing is, is there's a wiring that runs from that computer down to that transmission. That wiring can have an issue. The connector, the case connector can have an issue. There's something else going on that we're not diagnosing, but you're not going to have three bad solenoid packs in a row. And you could have debris in the transmission that's ruining the solenoids too. You, you need more than just a code to diagnose. That needs to be properly diagnosed by a transmission shop that knows what to take that code and implement it into their repair process more than just changing a solenoid because at this point, if you've changed it three times, you'll be changing it five. You need someone to see what's causing this to fail. Yeah, we need to actually diagnose it. If it's not something, you know, people are quick to, again, look at the definition of a code and say this has got to be what it is. But I, I've watched people. I had a guy at the uh, transmission shop down the street from me came over to me and he said, hey, we've got this Ford Focus and, in, in, uh, you know, it came up with a shift solenoid A code, so we swapped shift solenoids A and B, same code. It's got to have a bad computer. Computer. Well, that sounds logical, you know, but it was a solenoid performance code, so it didn't matter which solenoid you put there, it was going to come up with a shift solenoid A code. And it says when we turned on shift solenoid A, we're not getting the response we're looking for. But again, diagnostic, and, and Joel's pointed out, you know, uh, whether it be a transmission shop or somebody who's got a lot of experience with transmissions uh, can dial into that and, and find out what's going on. So if you need a good shop, bumper to bumperradio.com. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. Matt Allen is out. We've got Joel Bartko from Arizona Insport Specialist with us. And we've got Danny from the Bondurant High Performance School of Driving. And we are talking about cars. And one thing that's interesting, we were talking about during the break, 10 and 2. Who was raised to put your hands at 10 and 2? I that's was me. 10 and 2. 10 and 2. Steer it like a rope, right? <laughs> so, Danny, what's the, what's the new thing? You know, we teach people to drive with their hands at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. You get so much more maneuverability out of the wheel when you have your hands at 3 and 9. You get better visibility uh, down to the gauges. But also, the big thing is the advent of airbags has really changed some, some of this. So now, if an airbag deploys and your hands are in the wrong position, you, you're, you're likely to have more than just this, this uh, airbag coming at you. You might have your hands coming at you and other things. So when your hands are at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, uh, if, if the airbag were to ever deploy, which if you're driving with your hands at the proper position, you're probably going to be less likely to have an impact anyway. But if, if, if something were to happen and that airbag were to deploy, your hands would blow off to the sides rather than at you. Joe, what do you drive? I know I sold, I was just telling Dan here that I took my son Danny to driving school last year and I taught him 10 and 2 and to go hand over hand when you make a turn. And when he came back, and I drove with him. He was shuffling the wheel. And I said, who taught you that? And he said, that's what they showed me at school. I said, well, that's wrong. We went back and forth. They went to the school, and they explained to me that nowadays they shuffle the wheel over hand to hand. And I spoke to Dan, and he told me that that's kind of how they do it now. We, 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 we teach hand over hand. That part was right. The three and nine position is, is what we teach. But, uh, you know, a lot of police officers are taught to shuffle steer and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say shuffle steering is wrong, but the way we, we do it at the school seems to work the best. Well, good deal. Well, up first this segment, we're going to go with Wayne in Mesa on a 2012 Chevrolet Sonic. And, uh, Wayne, you're going to let me know what that is because I don't know. <laughs> go ahead, uh, Wayne. Yeah, uh, Dave, it's, uh, it's the, uh, I guess, the equivalent of the Ford Focus. It's a little five-speed transmission. Uh, uh, but my question is, uh, I bought this thing used that had uh, 12,500 miles on it, and I checked back on the records, uh, maintenance records, and it, there's no indication of when the oil was changed on this. And I looked in the owner's manual, and it says uh, that it may have uh, a automatic uh, oil sensor that um, announces on the annunciator panel when to change the oil. And I'm just wondering, it says may or may not have. I'm wondering, uh, 
is there any way to know that these all these little uh, engines that are on that Sonic have the automatic uh, annunciator to tell you to let you know when to change the oil? Well, Joel's raising his hand like he's in class. Go ahead, the first, Joel. The first thing I would do is go change the oil if you haven't changed the oil. That's number one. Cheap insurance. You, exactly. You want to have put good oil, good filter, and start from scratch. I still recommend the old school way, three months, 3,000 miles. You can go longer. Or if you go with a synthetic motor oil, go five, 6,000 miles. Oil changes and filters still cheap. It gets someone to look at your whole car while it's in there because you haven't had it even looked at. You should... Oil filter, it's still cheap, especially in the climate we live in with high heat here. Always want to put oil. That indicator, some of them are mileage-based. Some of them actually take into consideration the oil and the heat and the temperature and the way you drive. I would change the oil now, reset that, and start from scratch. Well, this is starting to become a frequently asked question here on the show because they have gone away from, you know, what's the interval and just go by this little gauge that says 40% oil life left, 30% oil life, 20%. At uh, Bondurant, do you guys go 3,000 miles before an oil change? <laughs> yeah, certainly not. No, and even though, uh, you know, like you said, we have on, on the Grand Sport Corvettes that we have at the school, they have uh, an oil life indicator. And if, if you scroll through the gauges, you'll see where that's at. And it, it might be down, you know, up 80%, 90% when it was first changed. And then as time goes by, it goes down. But we have, they have a very rigorous maintenance routine that they go through. And, uh, you know, they do it when they feel is, it's appropriate. And really, they, they don't let the cars run very long before oil changes, uh, you know, every 40 hours or so when they're changing oil. Well, the way I do it on my Honda Element is I, I use synthetic oil, and I do it every 5,000 miles regardless. It's, it's cheap insurance, and I abuse the car because I abuse it. I want better oil in there because I don't drive it like Granny Smith. I drive it full throttle or no throttle. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for the call, Wayne. Hope that helped you out. Let's go with John in Mesa on a 2006 Silverado. Go ahead, John. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, how you doing today? Good. Good. I have a uh, 06 uh, Silverado with the 5.3 liter Vortec engine. Here's my situation. When I first crank it up in the morning, uh, where my odometer is, it'll say uh, change engine oil. That's the first thing I notice. Second thing I notice is that my oil pressure doesn't get up to 40. It hovers around 35 or so for about five miles, and it's almost to the mile, to the tenth of a mile, five miles, and then I'll start to hear a tapping, like a lifter tapping. And two miles later, that tapping will go away, and my oil pressure gauge will bump up to oh, 40 to 45. Uh, what could that be? Well, first thing I'd be wondering, when did you change the oil? Was it was just not reset? Uh, 2,000 miles, I don't know. Uh, I I don't know how to reset it. I just changed my own oil. Okay, you did change oil. That was my first question. And you got yeah. good oil in there? Like, what weight oil are you using? I, I, I use uh, 1030 Valvoline Max Life. It's got 80, well, it's 84,000 now. I changed it to 82,000. Well, that, the oil light's coming on because no one reset it. That's the main reason your light's probably coming on. As far as the ticking sound and stuff like mm -hmm. that... I, I think I'd have somebody put an oil pressure gauge on that car and actually check the actual pressure. You may be hearing a lifter or something like that. Right. And now, a lot of times, you know, and that's, the, again, another common question on the show, do we have a gauge issue or do we have an oil pressure issue? And the only way we're going to know it is to verify, you know, with a pressure gauge as to whether the, the, it's right. 100% right, Dave. But that particular truck that he's driving do have a lot of instrument cluster problems as a pattern failure. That's why I would put the gauge on it and make sure. Okay, we're going to squeeze one more in. Danny in Sun City with a 1995, uh, looks like a GMC Jimmy. Go ahead, Danny. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, um, I, I'm getting a noise. It, it, it seems like it's coming out of the tranny. It's like a humming. It goes away right around 45 or 50. And if, I, if I'm at a standstill, it's humming. As soon as I drop it in neutral, the hum goes away. Now, I'm... I'm thinking maybe a tranny oil pump or something. I'm so if the cars if the cars in shifting? if the cars in park or neutral, no noise. As soon as you put it in reverse or drive, you get a noise. Yes. Okay. Uh, and other than that, transmission works okay. Works well, perfect. Well, I pretty much goes right along with a Torrington bearing going bad in the torque converter, and the reason I the, the way you diagnose it is in park or in neutral. 
the torque converter is doing absolutely nothing. It's just along for the ride. It's just turning the pump and the transmission. When you pull it into drive, what you do is you start to stall the converter and put a load on that Torrington bearing, and it's, it's almost like a buzzing or a whining noise. Very common problem, you know, or common problem with all vehicles. That's why it can, it's so easily diagnosed as a torque converter issue. So more than likely, that's what's going on. Depending on the quality of the transmission, some shops will pull out the transmission. They'll go ahead and look to make sure that there is no torque converter-related damage. Sometimes when those Torrington bearings come apart, a little piece of bearing goes right through the pump and it, it uh, scars the pump real bad. So it's a situation where you got more going on than just replacing a converter. But if the transmission is in great shape, there's no reason they can't reseal it, new fluid filter, and a new torque converter and put it back in the car. So not necessarily the whole thing. So if you're looking for a good shop, bumper to bumperradiocom We're glad you could all join us. And if you want to find a shop like Joel's, like I said, bumper to bumperradiocom Thanks, Danny, for coming in, teaching hey, us a little something about driving. Uh, if they, for having me. If they want to find Bondurant, A, we're going to put a link at bumper to bumper radiocom but how else would they find you? You can find us on the web at www.bondurant.com. We're down in Chandler, Arizona, right off uh, of uh, Wild Horse Pass Boulevard at Firebird 